We've been looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, which tells us that in the times past, Christ, God spoke through the prophets, but in his last days, he's spoken to us through his son. And not just any son. When we talk about somebody's son, we can often talk about somebody who may be heir apparent, or we can talk about somebody who resembles in many ways. Or we can talk about somebody who lives in the same house or someone who shares the same name. But the difference between that and what the Hebrew writer is trying to say about Jesus is important. And so we want to do some work on what we mean by Jesus as God's son. And here's the bold claim. Jesus is not just God's son. Jesus is also God the son. Now, I want to try to explain that a little bit this morning, a little bit of an explanation about who this Jesus is that we all claim to know and love and worship. You may remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at the size of the universe and the point at the end of that lesson about the size of the universe is that God looks at that and says, yeah, you know, I made that. And last week, we talked about the mystery of the universe. We used light as our main example, the mystery of the universe. And God says, yeah, I'm in that. Today, I want to talk about what it would look like if God took on human flesh. God came to earth. God became one of us. And we're going to look at Jesus Christ. And God declares, I am that. That phrase, I am is important because it starts in Exodus chapter 3 when God is talking to Moses through the burning bush. And God tells Moses, I want you to go and I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And and Moses says, who am I supposed to tell Pharaoh I've been sent to, sent by? And God says, tell him, I am that I am. Tell Pharaoh, I am has sent me to you. That's a pretty important and interesting Hebrew phrase. It can be translated a number of different ways, including I will be whom I will be. But however you translate it, what you get from that verse is God is saying, there really is no descriptor that can encapsulate all that I am. So just tell Pharaoh all that is, all that was, all that will be, is from me. All that you are, all that you were, and all that you will be can only be accomplished through me. And every possible experience ever done on the face of the earth has happened because of me. And so the only descriptor that I can think of to tell you who I am is I am. And that's why in the Old Testament, the most important teaching by anybody who belonged to the company of Israel, was that we serve one and only one God. It's called monotheism. It is extremely important. And I want to make this clear. Christians are also monotheists. We believe in one God. Mark 12, verse 29. Mark 12, 29, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, you want to know the greatest commandment? Here is the greatest commandment. And here's how he begins. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You're supposed to love him with everything you've got. No divided loyalties. If there's no divided loyalties, it means there is only one God. But notice the phrase, the Lord your God. The Lord is one. So whether you're Jewish or Christian, when you talk about God, you say there is one God. When you talk about the one God, you call him one Lord. And then we come to Jesus Christ. And something throws us for a loop. We're going to look at a couple of different passages today, and I really want you to have your Bibles out. I'm not going to have the verses up on the screen. I often do, and what will happen when I put them on the screen is that I'll be using whatever version best fits the meaning of the point I'm trying to make. But often the way that we can really understand and take to heart what's being said is when we see it in our own Bible. So I'd like you to get your Bible out. 
There are so many different versions in this congregation that I want you to read the one that you trust, the one that you hold close to your heart, the one that you read from at night as you're talking to God and asking him to bless your life. Jack P. Lewis was a tremendous scholar. He taught at Harding Graduate School for many years. He was on one translation committee, and he was an advisor to several others. He wrote a gigantic book, way too big to be read by an actual human, on the different versions, the different translations. One time he was giving a speech and a young eager student asked a question in a public forum. Dr. Lewis, you are either one of or the most renowned expert on Bible translations. Would you please tell me what is the best translation? And I loved his answer. Having read them all, having worked on many of them, having translated himself, he said the best translation is the one you will read. So I want you to read from the Bible in front of you. And let's look together. Jesus comes along and he says, I want you to know some things about me. He begins to make claims about himself that are hard to explain given the one truth we've already established that there is one and only one God, the great I am. In John chapter 8, verses 56 through 58, Jesus is talking to a group of religious leaders. He's already been questioned by them. He's been quizzed by them. He's challenged them back. But now he really lays something down for them that's very, very hard. He says, do you understand? I'm talking about that I'm the truth. I'm talking about I'm going to set you free. And they say, that can't be right. We're Abraham's children. How can you talk about you? You're not even 40 years old. And he says, let me tell you something. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad. I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, let's all say it together, I am. That is not a typo or a mistake in your Bible. It turns out the Greek phrase here can be translated simply, I am he. There's many places in the New Testament where Jesus simply says, oh yeah, that's me. I am he. But the reason why almost every translation puts here I am is because it seems so obvious that he is making a connection to what was said in Exodus 3 and verse 14. Before Abraham was born, I am. If you don't think that they understood the claim he was making, then you won't understand the next line where they picked up stones to kill him. You stone people for blasphemy, for claiming to be God himself. Let's look at another passage. In Mark chapter 6, you may remember near the end of the chapter, Jesus is waiting on the land while his disciples are out on a boat in the middle of the sea. And the storm gets really bad. And Jesus comes walking on the water. They're amazed by this. And then Jesus walking on the water. He appears to be a ghost, they say. He makes three statements all packed together. Now remember, Mark is probably the first of the four Gospels written. So this may be one of the earliest accounts in which you have this kind of language. Jesus makes three statements, and I want you to notice the three. One is, take courage. I think that's interesting because when God speaks to Moses at the, end of, at the beginning of the book of Joshua, at the end of Deuteronomy, when he speaks to Joshua at the beginning of Joshua chapter 1, God says, take courage. The second statement is, don't be afraid. At the end, when God's speaking to Moses and when God's speaking to Joshua, God, when he's announcing you're my person, you're the one I've established to lead my people, he says, take courage, don't be afraid. The third statement he makes is a third statement that God makes about himself in the Old Testament to Moses. I am. Here, Jesus doesn't borrow just one. He borrows three phrases from the lips of God to his chosen servant. And the people recognize 
He's not just saying this at any time. He's saying it while walking on the water. Search your Old Testaments. There is only one character who has control over the waters and the waves of the sea in the Old Testament, and that is God himself. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus is healing a paralytic. Yes, there are other people who are able to do healings. We have examples in the Old Testament of people who did healings. We have examples in the Old Testament of people who raised others from the dead. Maybe you remember Elisha doing that that very thing. But I want you to notice what Jesus does here that's even more remarkable, and he says so. The people are upset that he's healing somebody. And Jesus says, which do you think is harder? To tell this paralytic, pick up your mat and walk. Yes, others have done it, but I bet you can't do it, is what he's saying. But let me add something else. What's harder? To do great miracles, maybe even to raise somebody from the dead, or to say, your sins are forgiven. Well, you know, if we're just talking about the actual words coming out of your mouth, it seems a lot easier to say, your sins are forgiven. But you know what? It is much harder to actually do that because you can't. See, you can forgive somebody for hurting you, but how weird is it for you to forgive somebody else for what they did to somebody else? You have no jurisdiction unless you're God. And for him to say your sins are forgiven sent an announcement that the people recognize because the next line says that they said, who is this who dares to forgive sins? Only God can do that. In John chapter 10, in verse 30, Jesus is talking about his father, and he makes a very interesting, bold statement. He says, I and my father are one. Oh, you can take that a number of ways, I've been told. That's true. Aren't we all supposed to be one? Isn't a married couple supposed to be one? Don't we all become one in Christ Jesus, Paul says? Of course. But he says it in John 10, right in the middle of a book in which he's already claimed I am statements for himself seven times. And he says it, the same person who's already declared the greatest commandment is to have no divided loyalties, but but to believe in the one and the only one God, our God is one, at which he claims I and my Father are one. And if you don't think they didn't recognize what he was saying... You won't understand the next line, that they picked up stones to stone him. In John 10, in verse 18, Jesus says, I have control over my own life. I'm going to lay down my life and, watch this, I'm going to pick it up again. I have the power to lay down my life and the power to pick it up again. This command I received from my Father. Now, It is true that God has given his prophets the ability to heal. He's given his prophets the ability to do great sacrifices. But it was only by the power and mercy of God that God would then accomplish something else. He's saying, I've been given the power to lay down my life, and I have the power to raise it up again. I do that. Well, think about it. If he's not who he claimed to be, The easiest way for God to announce to the world that this guy is not telling the truth is to leave him in the ground. And he declares, I have the power to raise my own life. Jesus makes some claims about himself that challenge us. And it gives us really four options. Either Jesus is a lunatic, which means that he's thinking he's something he's not. It's very strange to take that conclusion because very, very few people who are out of their mind are able to make the kinds of sermons like Matthew 5 through 7 or make the kinds of statements that have gone on to change the entire world. If he is out of his mind, then how do we make sense of the fact that he starts the greatest revolution in the history of the world, that the greatest minds in the history of the world have decided to follow him? If he's not a lunatic, then he's a liar. What he's saying isn't true. Let's hold on to that one. The third option is that he's a legend. None of this really happened. I will tell you, about every about five years, somebody writes a book 
saying that Jesus never existed and he didn't make hardly any of these claims. And it's pretty amazing to me that you will find coming out of the woodwork some of the most skeptical scholars. But because they're scholars, they'll say, that's ridiculous. We have more evidence that Jesus existed than we have than almost any of the Caesars ever existed. And some of the claims about what he said come to us not from his followers. We have his followers' words here. But we also have claims he made about himself coming from his enemies. We have writings from the early centuries of people who don't believe in Christ saying, do you know what he was claiming about himself? Now, even if you challenge some of what we're understanding is what Jesus claims about himself, you still have to deal with the claims made by early Christians about him. What did the Christians believe about him? In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's writing this book to try to explain to people who this person is that we follow. And in Matthew chapter 1, he declares that the angel tells Mary that you shall call his name Emmanuel. And they're borrowing language from the Old Testament, which implies and means not just that God sent something to us, but that God is with us. And it's applied to Jesus Christ. Look in Colossians 1 and verse 18. I'm sorry, Colossians 1 and verse 15. Colossians 1 and verse 15. Here Paul is writing a letter to the church in Colossae, and he says he, meaning Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. <coughs> the language Paul is using is that Christ is in fact the image of God. He is in fact before all things. And then you have this interesting phrase, the firstborn of all creation. Some have seen this as a sign that the first thing God made was Jesus. That won't work for a number of reasons. But let me explain to you what I do think he's trying to say. That firstborn is the language of heir, the one who, is, who gets all the things that come from the Father. Notice all the things around it. It is true that in the Old Testament, everybody knew that God created all things. Everything came from God. But it's also true in the Genesis story that God used something to create. For example, in Genesis 1, the first couple of verses, the text says that God spoke. So you have words being used. In Genesis 1, around verses 26 through 28, he says, let us make man in our image. A plural language is interesting. In Genesis 2, the text says that God formed with his hands. So this idea that he's using wisdom or words or hands, this idea that God creates with something, starts forming language in the Old Testament. In Proverbs 8, with wisdom God made the world. The Psalms, with his breath he made the stars. So this idea that God made everything, everything comes from God, and yet God used something to make the world. The language here suggests what we're talking about Christ. Now, if you have God who is above all, and you have everything that comes from God, where do you place that which God used to create all things? The only answer is that it is, in fact, part of God himself. Colossians 1. What about John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3? In the beginning was the Word. We already knew that from reading Genesis 1. If God speaks, let there be light, then speech already exists. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, but the next part is really interesting. The next part, to form parallel language, says 
and the word was with God, and the word was God. Not just something God uses, something God is. And then we come to our text, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom He created the world. He's building a case. He's God's Son, we know that. He's heir, that's a little higher, through whom He made the world. That's very high, but we can go higher. He's the radiance of the glory of God. You mean he looks just like him? The light of God emanates through him? Yep, we can go one more. He is the exact representation or imprint of his very nature. The word here for representation or imprint or likeness is the word when a king would use a signet ring and put that ring in the wax, and then put that hot wax on the seal, and make a seal on the scroll. And that representation, or image, or likeness was as if the king himself was there. And the picture on the ring is supposed to say, this is the king. Jesus is the exact representation, image, or likeness of the very nature of God. So what do we do? He's either a lunatic, or he's a liar, or he's a legend, or he is, in fact, the Lord. Some people have asked, why doesn't the New Testament just come right out and say over and over again, you know Jesus is God, right? Because the phrase God, hotheos in Greek, was the language for God the Father. And the New Testament does not want you to confuse God the Father and God the Son. So they find every possible way to say Jesus has all the language, all the imprint, all the authority that you apply to the Father, and yet He is His own divine person. And this is why they try to find some way to explain it in a world in which they want to also affirm that there is one and only one God. So look at how they come up right to the edge of language and maybe beyond it. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6. Paul knows the Old Testament passage. There is one Lord God. That's the Old Testament. There is one Lord God. Jesus quotes it in Mark 12, 29. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. And using that phrase, here's what he says. For us, there is one God, God the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice what he's doing. Yes, we believe in one God, and we apply the same title, the same language, the same authority to the one that we recognized as Jesus Christ. Because you go right up to the edge of the language and then you find we don't have language for it, there are places where it seems to me this deep truth spills out. Look at this with me. We're in Hebrews, so look at the rest of the first chapter. Let's start in verse 8. Remember now, from verses 5 through 7, he's trying to contrast angels and Jesus. So in verse 8, he says, Of the Son, he says that he is God the Father. Of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God is forever and ever. Now, let me say that again. Of the Son, the Father says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, some of you may have a translation that says, God is your throne. 
The language can be translated either way. But look at how the parallel only makes sense. If the phrase is, your throne, O God, look at me, uh, look down here at verse 10. And you, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth. These are quotations in the Old Testament about God that are now being applied to Jesus. And the parallel is this. God says to Jesus, O God, and God says to Jesus, O Lord. Do you see that? We can go to Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. The text is already saying that we're going to wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory. Now look at the great language here. Of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're waiting for the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the appearing of one who's declared as God and Savior. We could look at Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7, which is the great Christ hymn that already tells us that even though he was in the form of God, he didn't think it robbery to be equal with God. And yet he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. You remember John 1. We quote that all the time. We've already quoted John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. But did you know even that is not the most powerful verse in the first chapter of John when it comes to the question of the nature of Christ? It's a powerful one. But verse 18 is even more powerful. Because verse 18 tries to say something there is no language for. Let me tell you what verse 18 says in the Greek. No one has ever seen God. But the only unique God who comes from God has declared God. What is he trying to say? You can't see Hotheos, which we've always meant to mean the Father. But one has come who is God, who has told us who God is. And if you don't think that's what John's trying to get across, remember, in, old, in the olden times, if you wanted to make a point and you wanted people to know what your book's about, you'd say something at the beginning and at the end. It's called an inclusio, and it says, here's what I'm trying to get across. John 1.18 is the beginning of the book. John 20.28 20, is near the end of the book. And John 20.28 20, is where Thomas looks at Jesus and declares, my Lord and my God. I think the idea of the Trinity is hard to explain. If you have a hard time with it, join the club. The Trinity is very hard to explain, but I'm convinced that it wasn't that somewhere in the third or fourth centuries, early Christians decided to find a Greek philosophy and fit the story into it. I think what happened is that people who believed in one God met Jesus Christ and needed new language to explain what they've seen. In God, in God are hidden all the blessings of wisdom and knowledge, and I find wisdom and knowledge in Jesus Christ. Only God is the way, the truth, and the life. And yet Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Only God can forgive sins. And yet Jesus forgave sins. And only God has the power to raise from the dead. And Christ says, I'll do that of my own accord. How do I find language to explain what I see in Jesus Christ? I think what they're saying is, in having to do with Jesus, we're having to do with God. So let's bring this to a close. Let's talk about what we're supposed to do with this other than just interesting line-by-line -line explanations calling Jesus God. Well, let's talk about why it's important to see Jesus as the exact representation of the Father, as the I am of the language of God. If God were to come in human form, 
If God were to have eyes and ears and live in the world, if God were to speak into this circumstance, what would he say? Suppose God was to walk by and find a woman caught in the very act of adultery. And there were people around all wanting to stone her. What would God do? Suppose that you had an issue of blood all your life. And suppose you were considered unclean, an outcast in society. And God was to walk by. What what would you do? Suppose you were up in a tree. And you wanted so much to belong to God and his people. And you saw someone walk by and people said the very presence of God is there. How would, how would you react? And what would God say to a tax collector who spent his life cheating his friends, but whose heart is able to be molded in a new way? What would God say? And if you, if you had all the sins in your life on your account, And you were destined to spend your life apart from him forever. And God was to come to earth and he was to do or say something to change your future forever. What would that be? And the answer is, in the words of Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The God of the Old Testament And the Jesus of the New Testament and the spirit of the early disciples is the same God. Think about that. The God that led Israel across the Red Sea and fed them in the wilderness speaks to us in the New Testament with this language, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How long I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. The church is connected to the power and grace of God because in communing with Jesus, in being the body of Christ, in being filled with the spirit of Christ, we are in fact participating in God himself. And third, Jesus' exclusive claims, the claims that I and I alone am God, the claim that unless you believe in me, you'll die in your sins, the claim that if you want to know what truth is, you've got to look at me. If you want to know where life is found, you've got to come to me. That's being made by the God of the universe. There is no salvation outside of Christ. There is no truth, goodness, beauty, or reality other than that defined by Christ. And the hope of the world, the answer to all of life's troubles, is found in Jesus Christ. And we know that because we've come to trust in the great I Am. And Jesus says, if you watch what I do, You watch how I live. You watch where I'm going and you reflect on what I'm about to do for you. You'll find God there. You'll find God there. I can't help but believe that if the world could see Jesus Christ, the world would fall on their knees and proclaim God the Lord of their life. And according to the New Testament, The way the world is going to see Jesus Christ is by looking at the hands and feet of Christ, which is you and me. If you're not in Christ, won't you make that right today? If you're in Christ, but the story you're telling is not the story of God, the great I am, take another look at Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.